Hi, my name is Bill Miller, and uh, I'm a Native American musician. I guess I, I, I'm the one, I'm going to categorize myself, so I don't let you do it for me. But uh, I grew up on an Indian reservation in northern Wisconsin. My music is strongly in, influenced by Native America, but I'm influenced by blues. Uh, I, I live not far from Chicago. I went to Maxwell Street, which is historic, and the change of blues becoming electric. The first trip to Maxwell Street was in the 60s, then in the 70s, and I, I, I just went down there and studied some incredible blues players. So I'm into blues, I'm into folk music, I'm into rock and roll. Uh, I, lately I've been into listening to classical music, but all music is uh, of, of the creator, and I, I just love great music in general, and uh, it's given me a platform to speak my heart and my mind and my faith through instruments, guitars, native flutes, percussion, and my voice. It has been an awesome journey through life being a musician. Well, the first time I thought that music would be a central portion of my life was, uh, I think I was about 20, 23 or 24 years old. I'd already been married for a few years and had uh, we had our first child. I started playing music when I was nine, but then it was a, uh, when it first came to me, it was just, um, it was a lot of fun. It was a good hobby. Like some kids collect arrowheads and or quarters or whatever they do. I, I, I wanted to play music. I played guitar and played trumpet, actually. Uh, but by the time I reached the age of 23, 24, I started realizing, because uh, I couldn't get away from music. I was going to art school at the same time, trying to get a degree, thinking that I should follow the formula as everyone else did. Just get my degree, just be a teacher, just get a house, like picket fence, um, whatever. Um, but no, I felt a calling. That's the way I... I it was like, you're called to do this. You're not a mechanic. You're not a good mechanic. I'm still not. You're not. You're not a good mathematician. You're. You're bad with money, uh, but you are good with a guitar. You can write a song, and so I felt a calling at that time. That's that's when I started to realize that all the years that I've been listening to music on an AM radio from an Indian reservation. At that time, when I was a kid, they used to play Perry Como, Frank Sinatra, Barbara Streisand, the Staple Singers, um, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin. Um, the Rolling Stones, the Beatles, and again back and forth, Tula Clark and George Jones and Johnny Cash and Lynn Anderson, and I was listening to it all. It was like it was like listening to unformatted radio at the time. Uh, it was it was previous to FM radio, so I took all it in, and I think inside of my soul I carried that with me like like a little precious uh, bag of songs. And by the time I hit 22, 23, I realized, wait a minute, I need to start interpreting what I lived. I observed my life for this long, now it's time to interpret what I've observed and time to apply that, and that's that's when it changed for me. I started playing uh, the cedar flute um, in 1976, and uh, this was interesting, a man named Louis Webster, who's uh, a great flute player from um, Wisconsin, was at a bluegrass festival that I was at with John Hartford. and. Um, I remember getting off the stage, it was in northern Wisconsin, at a place called Mole Lake. Uh, my, my friend was uh, a little bit intoxicated, he's a few years older than me, and he was carrying a couple of flutes with him and he was trying to sell them to these bands for pretty cheap just to get money to get home. And I said, I said, Louie, what, what do you need? He goes, I, 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 need, uh, I need to sell these flutes, man. I go, for what reason? I said, those are beautiful handmade flutes. Uh, they had one had a loon's head on and a duck's head hand carved and just, he's an awesome, he's a master flute maker. I said, well, um, how much do you want for it? He goes, I, I'm trying to get like uh, uh, 40 bucks or something. I go, well, I got 60 and I said, I'll give you a ride home. So anyways, he, I gave him 60 bucks. Now the flute now would probably go for a thousand dollars. It was super hand carved with a loon on it. I still have it. Um, and then as I took him home, he explained to me, he sobered up, explained to me why he makes the flutes, why the wood is this way, why he does this, and showed me, gave me a lesson that evening on playing the flute. Not for the commercial world. This was pretty awesome. He showed me why there is wind in our, in our, in our sails, basically. Why there's wind coming from here. That is, that is the breath of the crater. That this is how you fluctuate between the notes. This is what a bird sounds like. This is the way Indian people should be playing his flutes. I got a lesson from my master for 60 bucks. I, I took that flute and I put it above <coughs> uh, my guitars and I didn't play it for a year. I was so afraid of it. But then when I started playing it, it was like a mystical instrument that just took its own life. So I have a lot of respect for that instrument. Uh, I started playing it, like I said, probably seriously in 1977 and have been playing it since. I was in a hotel 
watching Discovery Network and they had a, a, a special on genetics. Um, these scientists have found that there's a, a gene in our body that, that when you reach a certain age, I don't think it's 87 or 88 or 89, basically your body stops deteriorating, it, 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 it lengthens you for a few more years and you start healing, you start going through a positive, it, it extends your life, it doesn't, it doesn't de-age, it doesn't go down. There's something there that the body does, it's really strange. They found it with older people that, wait a minute, the cells aren't dying. And, and he was saying that as soon as you leave the womb, basically, you're dying. And he says, what if you were to walk out in the streets and tell all these people in New York City, hey, excuse me, yes, you're dying. And I, and, and I use it as a first line from the song, you know, walk out into the streets, tell everyone you meet they're dying, sell everything you own and walk out on your own. You're, I'm speeding up. You're dying, dying. It's like Beatle-ish, it's sort of acoustic, but it's all about facing death in another way. So I didn't know how people would take it. I just played it at a at a couple of universities uh, with these hip kids and I thought, well, I'm going to give this a shot. And uh, to some people my age, it might be depressing to hear, but I'm actually talking about life, but it's amazing people my age how uptight they are about everything. But here's these 21-year-old kids flipping out, going, what is, you know, they got the message immediately. But that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm, and some of these songs are really, for me, cutting to the point, because I just turned 50, I just won my first Grammy, and what is this? You know, that's where I'm at now. In my, I, I've I've been on the road 28 years. I've made 16 records. I've toured with everybody imaginable. But what does it mean? Am I just piling this? That's what I want to cover too. Am I, I'm just piling stuff for accolades. Do I need that? No, I don't. Do I need? I, I I literally went through life with a bunch of labels though, and it's taken me to this year, Jim, to get the labels all off me. You're an alcoholic, son. You're a dumbass Indian kid from a reservation. You'll never be anybody. Boom, you know, carried that around with me for like years, years, years until I go, wait, I don't need this crap. Boom, I'm not that alcoholic son. Uh, you're, you're, you're a suicide kid, attempted suicide. You're, you're, you're screwed up, you know. Boom, you need Paxil, you know. Boom, you need this, you need this. You're financially off. You're, 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 you're never gonna whatever. All these things that are going on, and I saw damaging they were to me to, to just hold me back. And the same though, I can say for accolades because they can put you in a false sense of security. You need to live in the now. I'm living in the now as we speak. I just had a college interview me in paper said, so what are your plans for the future? Now she got the grandma, I go, my plans for the future are to get some sleep tonight and see a new morning. I don't have, I don't plan too far ahead anymore. I used to do that, I don't. I'm just gonna make music tonight. It's, it's shorter, it's much more intense this way. And when I write that way, the songs come out that way. And that's what happened on this record. It's like, I didn't put a time frame on it. I didn't put a budget on it. I and of course, that's when it happens. It's the same way when I met my wife. I didn't. I, I had blind dates set up for me by friends. Oh, you'll love this person. Go out to dinner with her. She's your perfect wife. You know, she was another guitar player. It sucked. We both argued. You know, we just it, we didn't get along. She's a great looking chick, and I'm thinking, oh, cool, man, this will work. Not. You know, she had long dark hair. I had long dark hair. We're like both playing Martins, and we both dated for a couple of weeks. And I hated her. She hated me because she wanted me to play background to her. I said, screw you. You know, and it didn't work. But then when I met my wife, it was done out of total friendship, total not committal things, but yet when you don't commit, and, and I am a committed person to d issues or things, that once we met, the sparks flew, you know, so that's where it's at. I, I know that now, it's why did it take me this long to know it? I don't know, but that's where the sparks are. It, it, it's, it's in that moment, it's in, as a filmmaker, as anything else. If you can't capture that, your film's dead. It's just nothing but a, um, 